Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. China by far is India's most powerful neighbor and certainly its most important neighbor. But there's a critical question about the relationship that we haven't got an adequate answer to. How does China see India? A book published this week answers precisely that question. Here it is. It's called How China Sees India, the Authoritative Account of the India-China Relationship. And its author is the well-known and popular former foreign secretary and arguably the best informed and certainly the most profound thinker about India-Chinese relations, Sham Saran. Sham Saran, let's start with a set of questions directly related to your title, How China Sees India. First, you write in your book, India and China have for centuries been strangers to one another. How little we really know about a country which is now a contiguous neighbor, a powerful adversary, and a challenge which manifests itself in multiple dimensions. So begin by telling me how is it and how do you explain to yourself the fact the two countries that share a border that's almost 3,500 kilometers long are so ignorant of each other? For one thing, uh, the border between India and China is of very recent origin because it is as a result of Chinese occupation of Tibet in 1950 that suddenly, you know, there was a border between China and India. Before that, there was no border except for a, a very small section, you know, in what is now, you know, Ladakh and, and Xinjiang. Uh, but essentially, there was no direct contiguous contact between India and China. So it is in 1950 that you are really coming face to face with uh, one another and not in the most happy of circumstances. Uh, so um, and through history, yes, there is a period of almost a thousand years where there were in fact uh, fairly sustained contacts between India and China thanks to the spread of uh, Buddhism. But not just Buddhism, I mean, there were other cultural linkages between the uh, two countries. Um, and Buddhism spread, as you know, throughout uh, China, and it is still one of the more popular religions in China. But beginning from about 1000 AD, you know, Buddhism itself in India diminished and then died. And then you had the Islamic invasions of India starting around the same time. So even these kind of limited contacts which were there between India and China, in fact, essentially came to an end. It is only the maritime trade, you know, between the Coromandel coast, the Malabar coast and the eastern coast of China continued uninterrupted. But essentially, the two countries fell off the radar screen, as it were, each other's <laughs> radar screen. And it is only sometime in the, you know, 19th century, that China and India come face to face with one another again after a long uh, gap. So Tibet, which calls itself the roof of the world, actually parted the two countries yes. very successfully yes. and kept us unaware of and not understanding each other. Well, this was a very major factor. And also, you know, the two countries were separated despite the fact, as I mentioned, that there was maritime trade uh, between the two countries. Uh, they were also separated by a large ocean space. That's right. So uh, it is not, therefore, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, surprising that uh, they did not really have much, you know, familiarity with one another. It is surprising until you explain that, in fact, Tibet for many centuries was like an independent country between it the was. two separating yes. them. Today, because we think of Tibet as part of China, right. we believe we have this huge 3,000-mile boat. But in fact, that yes. wasn't the case. No. The other striking thing about the India-China relationship that emerges from your book is when you write, India is a retreating image in China's rear view mirror. Now, that's a particularly evocative phrase, because not only does it make clear that India is behind China, but it's falling further and further behind, which is why it's retreating. True. Um, the reason why it is a retreating image is precisely because if you look at virtually every metric of power, economic, military, technological, in all these dimensions, at least for the last maybe 15 years or so, uh, the gap between India and China has been expanding. So 
uh, I have also mentioned in the book that uh, in more recent interactions that I have myself had uh, with uh, Chinese uh, academicians, their uh, security analysts, uh, they make the point that, uh, you know, our Indian friends should understand that China is today five times the size of India and uh, this will naturally have an impact on the nature of India-China relation, meaning that by you should know your place. No place. <laughs> Quite right. You are a small little country yes. compared well, to us. Well, not so small, but uh, certainly... In terms less... of economy, in terms of yes. power. Yes, yes. So that is why I have used that image, that as far as China is concerned, uh, it does not see India like it did before, say, 2007, 2008, as also in the same category as China, you know. The emerging, the group of emerging economies. This, this perception BRICS. has changed since 2007, 2008. It, it has become very accentuated, I would say, after 2007. So there's a sense in which in China bought into the Chindia concept, but no longer does. No doubt, longer does. But in fact, you point out in your book that even traditionally, China never thought very highly of India. Its regard for India was limited by the fact that it saw India as a slave nation. You write, China looked upon India as a slave nation ruled by a foreign power during the British colonial period. Worse, you point out, in the various British military assaults against China in the 19th century, it was Indian soldiers who served as shock troops for the British. It was Indian opium traders who flaunted their wealth in the new urban centers of Shanghai and Hong Kong. I take it much of the negativity that China feels towards India arises out of this history as well. So, uh, let me just uh, nuance that a bit because uh, I would say that the Chinese attitude towards India today is one of ambivalence uh, because there is also a recognition that a certain time in history, uh, India was an alternate center of culture and civilization. In many ways, it was even superior to China because <laughs> there were uh, Chinese monks and pilgrims who were coming to India to study in universities. And Buddhism like went from India. Right. There were about, at, at a certain point of time, uh, there were something like 3,000 Indian monks who were there in various monasteries in China uh, who were translating uh, Indian scriptures into Chinese. Uh, they were preaching Buddhism uh, in China. But this uh, is almost 1500 years ago. Uh, well, a thousand years ago, because as I mentioned, around 1000 AD is when the change began. So there are still memories of that time that India is a different place from, uh, you know, the um, concentric circles of less civilized, less cultured uh, countries around China. You know, uh, so India did not fall into that mandala <laughs> as it were. Uh, so there is memory of that time and even today sometimes there is a certain surprise when they see for example India's uh, achievements in science and technology say in space or in, uh, in atomic energy it comes as if oh really I mean is this country also capable of this we didn't expect it of we them. didn't expect it of that so there is a kind of an ambivalence but yes it is true that perhaps the negative component in that, you know, perception is certainly the more dominant. Uh, component. And that negative component is how they perceived India during the years of British uh, Yes. Rule. So, as I said, when after about a thousand years, uh, China once again confronted India, it confronted an India which was already under colonial rule, right? And then, as you men yourself mentioned, the, the way they saw India through the Indians was, you know, the shock troops used by the uh, uh, British and also the opium uh, trade. trade itself. Which even, they hated. Even though there was a period of some mutual sympathy and support because, you know, India was involved in this very uh, extended freedom struggle, uh, anti-colonial struggle. Um, China itself was also, in a sense, confronting the Western challenge. So there was a certain element of mutual sympathy and support, but never uh, enough to overcome this negativity. Now, what you point out in a book, which I found particularly fascinating, is you say that since 1947, when India became independent, and 1949, when the communists took over China, there have been two events that have further introduced differences or some measure of separation in the relationship between Beijing, as it's called today, Peking as it was then, and New Delhi. And the first of those is, in fact, you write, 
while independent India chose a liberal parliamentary democracy as its political dispensation, China became a one-party communist republic. This only compounded the lack of mutual understanding. But this, in a sense, was inevitable. Oh, sure. I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, there was this strong ideological element in the area. I mean, these were two newly emerging Asian powers. But the political dispensation which each chose was very different, radically different from one another. And therefore, it should come as no surprise that this also had an impact in terms of how we saw uh, each other. To give you an example, China was not able to understand that an independent India in 1947 continued to have the British, <laughs> you know, uh, Governor General, the Viceroy, as its first head of state. As an independent India, it could not understand how an independent India uh, could continue to have, say, the British Indian Army, continue to have the British Civil Service. So even though there was a change in the leadership, it did not seem to impact on the institutional framework which underlay the British colonial administration. In China, there was a great difference, isn't it? Their perceptions of how to respond to their individual pasts were very, very different. Yes. yes. Sure. Did they buy into Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai? Well, uh, you know, it was a very useful political slogan. <laughs> from our point of view? Uh, well, even from their point of view, because there was a certain period in which they were under tremendous amount of pressure, particularly from the United States. There had been the Korean War. Uh, there was a whole Taiwan uh, issue. And therefore, the closer relationship with a non-aligned India gave them a certain amount of diplomatic. So while it served their purpose, they bought into it? Yes. The second difference or the second event that created differences between them which you mentioned in your book is the Indian decision to grant asylum or sanctuary to the Dalai Lama. You say it changed Chinese threat perceptions regarding the India-China border. Did that become a major problem in their eyes? One that we didn't quite oh, understand uh, in uh, the same way? Yes, I, 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 I think so. Because uh, what happened was that there were skirmishes taking place at the border even before 1959, before the uh, Tibetan uh, revolt. Uh, but these were skirmishes, and they were regarded by both sides as skirmishes, did not have a major significant adverse impact on the overall relationship between the two countries, which continued to be reasonably positive. But when the Tibetan revolt took place, and India gave shelter to the Dalai Lama, we perhaps fail to realize that from the Chinese perspective, this was something which was a direct kind of a threat to, to their control of Tibet. You know, they were very nervous after the revolt about the uh, kind of you know unrest which was. Can I interrupt and ask this? Why were we surprised? by the way the Chinese perceived us giving asylum to the Dalai Lama because they weren't particularly happy when he came on a visit a couple of years earlier. They had apprehensions even then that he might stay on and might not return. So when he actually did come seeking asylum, we should have been aware that this is not going to go down terribly we, well in We uh, knew that uh, this would not uh, be received uh, very <laughs> positively by the Chinese side. But uh, I think we perhaps uh, underestimated the level of anxiety and concern about what was happening uh, on the Chinese side. And this goes back to the first point you made about ignorance of each other. Not ignorance of each other and the political dispensations being different. Quite Because, right, yes. you know, the Chinese... We were a democracy. Not, yes, they weren't. The Chinese did not understand that how could a democratic India not extend shelter to the Dalai Lama. And it India has gone against everything that India, <laughs> India stood for. And I presume in converse, India expected as a democracy that the Chinese will understand that we're yes. giving sanctuary. Yes. It's what's expected of us. Sure. And, and you know, I, I think Nehru felt that he had a good enough relationship with Chow Dai that he could, you know, explain uh, this to the Chinese side. Uh, but uh, failed to realize uh, that in, in Chinese perception, what India had done was a very hostile act against China. This is where ignorance of each other becomes such an important factor. And this is also where Agreed. the fact that they were communists, we were Democrats. Yes. And therefore, the dispensations are so different becomes another important factor. Quite right. 
Quite. And yet at the time possibly, no one was aware that these were problems in the relationship that were compounding our lack of understanding of each other. Quite right. So what I have pointed out, that I referred to the skirmishes which were taking place before. Now, post-1959, wherever there were any kind of moves made by the Indian side, even if there were patrols being mounted to uh, various areas, um, they began to be seen as part and parcel of an Indian effort to subvert Chinese control over Tibet. Because of the Dalai Lama factor being in right, the background. Right. So we did not understand that what were regarded quite rightly by both sides as not very important uh, you know, clashes uh, on, the, on the border. These were very minor clashes. Uh, we thought it doesn't really mean very much. Nehru actually <laughs> believed that China would never ever go to war with India. Uh, because these were very minor incidents. What he did not recognize was that after 1959, these minor incidents actually became very major events. Because uh, from, of how China saw them. That's right. And because we couldn't see it the way China saw it, we Quite remained right. ignorant of what was happening. Quite right. And also, we did not link this with various domestic developments taking place in China. Because, you know, this was the time when there was a tremendous opposition to Mao's leadership. You know, there had been the Great Leap Forward, which had been such a major disaster for China. Um, Mao Zedong was being pushed into what was then known as the second line of leadership. And it is more pragmatic leaders like Tang Xiaoping, Liu Shaoqi, who were really, you know, trying to salvage the situation for China. Now, Mao Zedong, you know, tried to you know, uh, counteract this by turning to the Chinese People's uh, Liberation Army, seeking support uh, from the PLA. And the India-China conflict Got part became of part and parcel of that domestic conflict. So this is not just misunderstanding each other, this is not understanding each other at all. Well, uh, I mean, in retrospect, oh. <laughs> in retrospect, you know, I would say that it would have been uh, wise not only to keep, uh, you know, an eye on what is happening at the border and how it is being perceived on the other side, but also keeping an eye as to what is happening within China. Which is why the title of your book is so very important. I'm holding it up again. How China sees India is critical to India's understanding of the Chinese yes. relationship. Yes. If you can't see yourself through the eyes of the other, then you'll never know what the other thinks of you. Yes, so that's, that's in very simple terms, yes, what you have said <laughs> is why I have written this book. Which brings me now to 1962, because in a sense, it was a culmination of everything that had happened up to that point in time. Am I right in saying that the impact that 1962 had on India's attitude to China is far greater than the impact the other way around? Uh, because we came worse uh, off. Uh, yes, to, to some extent. But uh, let me uh, then again uh, go back to how China then looks at India post-62. Because uh, as I mentioned to you that historically, India did not quite fall within the kind of you know, s schema uh, that China had. That it is the center of civilization, advanced culture and civilization. And it had these concentric circles of less civilized, less cultured countries around it. Which is why there is a, that sense of centrality about China. Which is why nation. they call themselves the Middle Kingdom. Quite right. But India didn't quite fall into that category, as I explained to, uh, to you. What 1962 did was to enable China to actually put India In that into category. that schema. That no, you are not an alternative center of culture and civilization. 62. You are a lesser power because we have defeated. Quite right. 62 diminished India even further That's in Chinese right. eyes. Yes. Because they won. Yes. And they won so easily. Yes. And then retreated, uh, declared yes. ceasefire, uh, leaving us humiliated. Yes, quite right. I mean, that was humiliation. I mean, there is no way that you can get away from that. This is a bit of an aside, but because I interviewed him recently, let me ask you this question in the context of 1962. How do you view Avtar Singh Bhaseen's book, where he argues that India's claim to both the western and the eastern border, that is to say, Aksai Chin and the Makman line, is both weak and also difficult to substantiate? And then he also says that whereas 
India in its policy and its execution was often contradictory or contrary, the Chinese have been consistent. How do you view that particular interpretation? Uh, Avtar Singh is a very good archivist. Uh, he is probably unmatched in terms of the manner in which he has, you know, brought together uh, some very rare documentation on India-China relations. So in terms of what I'm talking about here, that is also an uh, important contribution. However, I do not uh, agree with the kind of, you know, uh, sort of assessments that he has given for two reasons. One is when he's talking about the, you know, uh, eastern border, you know, essentially the uh, so-called Makmohan line. What is important to remember is that even though in 1947, the then Dalai Lama government in Lhasa did make very extraordinary claims uh, against India, which he has uh, referred to and which is uh, correct, one should not forget that in 1940, at the Simla Convention, the three parties, that is the British, uh, the Chinese and the Tibetans, each one of them were plenipotentiaries. That is, they were fully authorized to negotiate on behalf of their respective governments. And the, uh, the Tibetan representative put his signature to a treaty that showed the border between Tibet and India as falling along the highest watershed, which was then uh, termed as the Matmohan Dime. So, uh, to say that, uh, you know, the uh, Tibetans raised raise these issues and that there was some kind of, you know, uh, legitimacy to those, that's simply not correct. Secondly, if you take uh, the Western uh, theatre, you know, the Eastern Ladakh where we are having uh, a problem at this point of time. Uh, I have pointed out earlier, and I think I may have also mentioned this in this book, that even at the time when China had the maximum extent of territory, which was under the Qing dynasty, you know, under Qianlong uh, Emperor, the maps which China itself put out at that time never showed a Chinese territory south of the Kunlun Mountains. In fact, the Kunlun Mountains in Chinese is known as Nanshan which means southern mountain. So they actually traditionally formed the, border. the su southern border of uh, China. So it was essentially, where is Aksai Chin? Aksai Chin is essentially between the uh, Kunlun range and the Karakoram range. That is the territory which we are talking about. So if you say that uh, India's claim is weak, I would say so China's, is China's. Claim, China's claim is weaker. Because at least during the time of the Dogra kings, there were, you know, uh, tax uh, collection, for example, from herders who were using Aksai chain. There was a customs post at a place called Shahidullah, through which, the, you know, the Central Asian caravans used to go into Yarkan, to Kashgar. And these were also tax collections were made by the Dogra kings. So um, to say that, uh, you know, the Chinese had a better claim, and that Indian claims were really specious, that I am not quite certain that that is the right uh, reading of history. Okay, that was, as I said, a bit of a deliberate side excursion because I have interviewed Avtar Singh Basin and people would have found it very odd if I didn't raise that issue with you since you are perhaps the most acknowledged expert on India-China relations that I am going to ever have interview. Let me come back to your book. Writing about the present period, or should I say the more recent period of the India-China relationship, you say China would like to see India slotted into a subordinate role in an Asia dominated by itself. Does that mean that China will always thwart India's rise? Oh yes, of course. Always. Well, you know, what is the logic behind the China-Pakistan alliance? It is a low risk, low cost way of keeping India tethered, as I say, in the subcontinent. And this goes right back to the early 60s when yes. that relationship began. So China yes. was thinking so, decades ahead. Yes. Well, I took advantage of a certain, it was not responsible for India-Pakistan conflict. But it took but advantage of took it. great advantage of that. And uh, this conflict. is again why they are stalling us at the <clears throat> NSG today. 
Uh, yes, uh, but today at the NSG, they feel that they are strong enough to stand alone. Previously, they couldn't. In 2008, when they saw that they would have to be the last country to raise its hand and say no, they did not. Now they don't mind being the only country. They want to be seen as the one country which can actually say no. So as far as the NSG is concerned, China is an implacable obstacle. At the moment, yes. And there's no way around it at the moment that we can see. Uh, no, but I mean, uh, although this perhaps uh, is somewhat, somewhat away from the main uh, subject of our discussion, the fact is that the waiver which we managed to get in 2008 essentially gives you whatever you want. And you don't need NSG. Uh, it would be better if you had the membership, but even if you don't get the membership, it does not in any practical sense uh, inhibit you uh, in terms of Absolutely, your... Absolutely, but to the extent that you want the membership and you've attempted to get it, China remains an yes. implacable obstacle. Yes. yes, And we can't see a way around it at the moment. Uh, not for the foreseeable future. The paradox, and you for point this out very forcefully in your book, is China's self-belief of itself. And we've touched on this a moment ago, that it's the middle kingdom in the center of the world. It's actually, as you call it, imagined history. It's imagined history to seek legitimacy for its claim to Asian hegemony. And you write, there's little in history to support the proposition that China was indeed the center of the Asian universe, commanding deference among less civilized states along its periphery. But this illusion has a firm and fast hold on Chinese thinking. Oh, yes. How do yes. you shake it? Oh, well, by making it clear that the ground situation is very different from what you think it is. But that's not clear I at know. the moment to the Chinese at all. Uh, well, uh, currently, even if that was history as China, you know, tells it, uh, today, Asia is really home to a cluster of major powers, including India itself, but not only India. You know, if you take powers like Japan, if you take uh, South Korea, if you take, uh, you know, the Southeast Asian countries, particularly, say, uh, a country like uh, Indonesia, Australia, this particular geopolitical space is a very crowded space, isn't it? I mean, by fairly major powers and powers which are, again, expanding their at least military capabilities, if not always their economic capabilities. And the United States of America continues to be a very important presence in this region. So you're suggesting that collectively these powers will have to shake the Chinese illusion. They already are. They already are. So is the illusion diminishing and disappearing? Well, let me give you a very recent example. You know, you had the recent visit of the Foreign Minister of China, Wang Yi, to the Pacific states. You know, they had come to an agreement with Samoa. They refused collectively a security agreement with China exactly. and snubbed and, him to and, his face. And, uh, and uh, it was a bit embarrassing for Wang Yi. If you remember, there was a press conference together with the Fijian Prime Minister, and uh, they just very sort of abruptly walked out because they didn't want to face questions, embarrassing questions about why this document was not concluded. And if the little island states of the Pacific can do this, then the bigger nations like Japan, Indonesia, India, Australia can certainly help wean China off this illusion uh, yes, is. the only way the illusion can be, uh, in, in a sense, dispelled is by, you know, proving to the other side <laughs> that this is actually an illusion. And it's happening. So, so take, for example, the Quad. If you remember when uh, Prime Minister uh, Modi had gone to Singapore for the Shangri-La Dialogue, I think a few years ago, and he had spoken about the Quad as, you know, a, a reflecting... Uh, a platform for cooperation across the Indo-Pacific, Indo you know, and being very inclusive. At that time, uh, same Wangi dismissed the Quad as so much foam on the ocean's waves, which will be dissipated very quickly. So it was, a, you know, dismissive. Uh, very dismissive. Today, you are saying this is an Asian NATO in the making, <laughs> which is directly, you know, threatening uh, China. So China's illusion is beginning to break. Uh, uh, well, I mean, they will, I suppose, continue to uh, sell the narrative of 
the inevitability of Chinese dominance of Asia. But they know uh, the truth may be different. But I think it is, it is changing. Particularly after the Ukraine war, I think, you know, I have made the point that Chinese made a bad bet. <laughs> so I think that also is, uh, is, is a factor. Do you think China is beginning to regret the agreement they signed in February with Putin? Where they so strongly committed themselves to Russia? I think there is a clear uh, sense in China that uh, this was perhaps a miscalculation. This is through people that you've spoken to or is it also uh, Some people, people who I've spoken to but also some of their very uh, well-regarded and highly respected uh, analysts. Uh, uh, are publicly have saying, and they're publicly saying so? Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they have, uh, they have uh, actually published articles where they talk about, you know, how uh, China has to be very careful. It will not uh, try to, you know, jump the sanctions which have been... This put. is fascinating. So as Russia gets bogged down or fails to achieve, which it certainly is going to its major target of getting Kiev and destroying the Ukraine, this relationship with Russia could also begin to alter a bit. It could. It could. Although I think there continues to be a very strong convergence of interest between the two sides. What I'm pointing out to is that despite that projection of very strong strategic partnership between the, the two inner countries, thinking is changing. Take one example. The uh, Russian air fleet, commercial air fleet, has been virtually grounded. There's no maintenance possible. There are no spares available. And China is not helping door, out. China actually has a very large aviation industry, mostly joint ventures because they have a very large Boeing fleet. They have a very large Airbus fleet. So for maintaining that fleet, there are actually several facilities for both manufacture of spares and for maintenance. The Russians did make a request to China for some spares. And China declined? Declined. And, the, and there was actually a public reaction from uh, Russia's uh, expressing disappointment. Right at the end of your book, there is a clear suggestion. I was going to say hint, but actually not. It's more than a hint. It's a clear suggestion that the path Modi's India is on, the direction in which it's moving, is not necessarily the best one for meeting the Chinese challenge. You say, and I'm quoting you, the rise of narrow nationalism, the deliberate stoking of communal discord, and the attempt to put a monochromatic frame over a diverse country with a multiplicity of languages, religions and cultural traditions which we are witnessing today devalue the very assets which make India distinctive and which, we enable, and which will enable it to navigate a world in which borders are becoming less and less relevant. And then, more importantly, you add, I believe that India has a better chance to meet the Chinese challenge by remaining committed to the values enshrined in its constitution. Explain this point further. I think it should be fairly obvious, isn't it? I mean, I have said time and again that uh, the great strength of India is precisely its ability uh, to manage immense plurality. And if the world of tomorrow is going to be more globalized, as I believe it would be, then you need countries that are able to handle plurality. Because if you move away from plurality within your country, how are you going to handle plurality outside your borders? You know, you are going to have a, a, a globalized world where you are literally stepping on each other's toes all the time. But the connection you're making with inability to handle plurality at home and handling plurality abroad is not one that's occurred to anyone running India today. Uh, uh, well, I have said even earlier, in, you know, the earlier book that I had written, I said you cannot, in fact, pursue an expansive foreign policy with a more narrow kind of a policy at home. But do they realize if, that? Big one? Do they realize that here? You know, that is not for me <laughs> to say. Because, because there's no sign I have, of it. There's no that, sign that they are actually aware of the disjunction that you brought so clearly into the limelight? I would hope that uh, that uh, disjunction would be, uh, be clear because after all, we do have ambitions uh, to play a larger regional role, to play a larger global role. So if we are pursuing those goals, uh, I think it would become obvious very soon that, you know, by 
following a policy which is, as I said, more narrow in focus, uh, more inward looking, uh, is not compatible with that ambition. In fact, it's not just not compatible with the requirements to meet the Chinese challenge, it's not requirement with the wider interests of Indian foreign uh, policy. Uh, true, but I would also add, finally, that, you know, uh, there is a foreign policy challenge to be uh, met, but it's far more important in terms of what India wants to be. You know, what is the vision that you have for the future of India? Because why have I referred to the Constitution? Because the Constitution of India does sketch out what is the kind of society that India should be? What is the kind of country that we want to be? What, are, what is the idea for which India stands? And I think that is something that perhaps requires going back into and perhaps trying to reflect on what those values are. In fact, the idea for which India stands, to which it committed itself so wholeheartedly in 1950 in the Constitution, is perhaps the best reason for us being one day a permanent member of the United Nations Security I Council. I agree with you. It's I, the best reason for us being part of Quad. I, I agree with you. It's the best reason for us being considered a high table country. But if we move away from that idea itself, the world will begin to wonder, is it really the country we want as a partner? Well, there will be perhaps major powers who would still see merit in working together with you because of... Because they're very uh, similar I mean, themselves. There is a, yes, and there is also the challenge of China that they know is difficult for them to meet by themselves and India can be a very important factor in but that. But those respect. are strategic relationships. Yes. Those are not moral but values it is not, being shared. I, I think we should not say that therefore we need not worry about what is happening inside. I would say that it is far more important, not because of foreign policy considerations, but it is far more important in terms of what I said uh, is the future of India. Absolutely. India is the India of the constitution, if yes. it ceases to be, it ceases to yes. be India. So, that's why I say that India needs to be more India, rather than to try and emulate China. what is China. Absolutely, that's the wrong thing to do. But coming right to the end, look down the road for me, first over the one, next one year, and then if you can over the next five years, how do you see the India-China relationship developing? I won't say go down the road 10 years because that may be too difficult to do. So I have said that at this particular point of time, perhaps we are in a relatively speaking somewhat better position because of what Ukraine war has done to Chinese calculations and to Chinese, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of place that it has uh, in the emerging world order. So, if China thought that its moment had come, you know, Xi Jinping says we are living in an era of changes not seen in a century. He adds that the balance of power has changed, but he adds with that irretrievably, irreversibly. That means, <laughs> you know, uh, the, uh, where he sees the centrality of China is no longer something in doubt. I think what has happened with the war in Ukraine, what is happening today in China as a result of, you know, the zero COVID policy, uh, it has had a major dent on Chinese economic uh, prospects. China's economy is slowing down. So if you are take all this together, then the kind of pressure that we have faced from China over the last several years, perhaps there may be some room that may be now available for us to try and advance our interests. Secondly, I have also argued that precisely because other major powers like the United States, Western Europe, Japan, they all would like to see India as a very important, significant component of any kind of countervailing strategy with respect to you know, the assertion of Chinese power, uh, that also gives India leverage. And if these countries also happen to be, despite being in relative decline, I do not deny that they are in relative decline, but they still continue to be the repositories of the most sophisticated technologies in the world. They continue to be the sources of capital in the world. They continue to be very important markets for the world. So if we are able to 
टेक एडवांटेज ऑफ अ मोर बिनाइन जियो पोलिटिकल पार्टनरशिप विद दैम टू ट्रांसफॉर्म इंडिया इट सेल्फ बिकॉज रियली दी ऑब्जेक्टिव ऑफ इंडियन फॉरन पॉलिसी शुड बी हाउ यू कैन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टू द ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन ऑफ इंडिया एंड इन दैट ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन ऑफ इंडिया दिस जियो पोलिटिकल मोमेंट इज पर हैप्स अ फेवरेबल वन हिडन इन दर आंसर वॉज द थॉट that our relationship with china and our attempt to seek an equitable balance with china depends a lot upon strengthening our relationship with the western countries russia's role is diminishing oh, yes there is no doubt that the russian role is diminishing it has been diminishing even before <laughs> the uh, ukraine war but markedly so now uh, i expect that it would precisely because of the impact on the russian economy even with respect to the legacy issues you know for example our dependence upon china or russian spares components um, some of the hardware that we still continue to source uh, from uh, russia uh, there are problems because those industries in russia have also have been disrupted as a result of this and war. they need their spares themselves at the moment quite too. right and also many of the items which we were sourcing from russia many key components came from ukraine because in the old soviet union it was ukraine which was really the Industrial engineering belt. base and the uh, you know defense Absolutely. industry of the old soviet union which continued after ukraine became uh, independent so even though we may be ostensibly purchasing spares and components and hardware from russia many parts of that were actually coming from ukraine so we have four engine, frigates particularly engines for our submarines that plus four frigates that we have bought from russia cannot be delivered because those engines marine engines have to come from ukraine <laughs> so i think these complexities are sometimes missed these complexities are what make this interview such a joy to have conducted with you thank you the nicest thank thing about talking to you is you can take a simple answer and reply with one of the most profound questions <laughs> and those questions themselves raise other answers thank you other thank you thank you uh, karan for giving me this opportunity i really appreciate it thank it you it was a pleasure thank, thank you. you very much indeed thank take you. care thank stay you. safe thank you